I love Cincinnati. I love people, food, and beer. Great beer. Like most cities, it has a huge history. Its famous suspension bridge was built by John Roebling, the same guy who is famous for the Brooklyn Bridge. I read a note from my best friend and neighbor, Sammy Wright. Matt, the garage key doesn't work, so you'll have to go through the back door and use the kitchen door to open the garage door. The back door is never locked, so getting in will be easy. These were the instructions Sammy gave me. He was stuck in one of the biggest meetings he had ever had. His company, CMW, was in negotiations to acquire the German company. If the merger is successful, the new company will control almost a quarter of the cutting tools, cutters, splines, and worm shafts in the world. And Sammy will become a very rich man. Not that he has it too bad, but neither do I. I sold real estate and now had six offices scattered throughout the city. My name is Matthew, Matt Womack. Since the business plan was Sammy's brainchild, he had to be present at the meeting. He had another meeting scheduled for today. It was with a local BMW dealer where he was to take delivery of a new 740i he had bought for his wife Julia for her birthday. He intended to park the car in the garage and surprise her when they went out to dinner that evening. Since her meeting with BMW was not scheduled to take place ahead of time, he asked me to pick up the new car and put it in his garage. She plays bridge at your house, so it won't be any problem if this happens without her knowledge, he said. I've never driven a 740i before, so I was looking forward to it. Chris, my wife, Christina Womack, told me about the bridge game because it was going to be at our house that week. Four girls played every Wednesday, and they changed houses. Of course, there was Chris and Julia, plus Kendra Page and Cindy Epstein. That morning, Sammy took Julia's car under the pretext that it needed to be fixed. Chris's car was in our garage, and in Sammy's driveway were two vaguely familiar cars that I assumed belonged to two other card players. The question was, why were they at Sammy's house? They were supposed to be in my house. Sammy had a road two cars wide, so I pulled over behind the car on the left. I entered through Sammy's never lockable back door. I had just walked all the way inside when I heard loud laughter coming from the kitchen. I froze and just stood there. They were supposed to be next door to my house. The laughter died down a little, and I heard one of the ladies speak. They usually had a couple of drinks on card day, and it seemed this day was no exception. Fine, so we all agree. There was general agreement and I just stood there. I didn't recognize this voice. I was sure it wasn't Julia or Chris. However, the next voice belonged to Julia. So, here's what we'll do. The voices died down, so it was obvious that they had moved into another room. I rushed to the wall where the garage door button was. There was also a video surveillance button. I knew this because I helped Sammy install it myself. It was not only a video, but also an audio system. He wanted to be able to look after the children wherever they were in the house. There were three main control units. There was one in the garage where I was, one in the kitchen, and one in the master bedroom. I opened the wall cabinet that contained the control buttons and turned it on. The first button I pressed was the living room. Nothing. Then the dining room. Nothing. Then the den. Bingo. The camera turned on and I saw the four of them sitting at a card table. I just hoped that none of them would notice the red light on the camera, indicating that they were being recorded. I missed some of the conversation, but not much. Just like before, we draw cards to see who comes first, second, third, and then last. Each of us must do something different to tempt him to sleep with us, and we can't offer him money. Everyone laughed. Kendra spoke, laughing. This may be the only way some of them will have sex with Chris. Everyone laughed at the joke. Jesus, girl, with a body like yours, those bastards would pay you. The others agreed. Actually, me too. Kendra's body was the killer. The next voice belonged to my wife. I hope I can do it better this time. But you have to admit that we gave you an A for originality, said another unfamiliar voice. It must have been the last of the four. After this comment, everyone laughed. Hell yes, Julia spoke. Him going with you to pick up Cindy's sick puppy was a stroke of genius. The way you made the puppy puke on him and then made him strip and shower in Cindy's shower so you could join him was brilliant. Everyone laughed. Fine, it's time to draw cards. 
Julia said, shuffling the deck. Chris, you go first. The highest card sleeps with him first. Chris pulled out the queen. At least this time, I won't be the last. She laughed. Remember, we're not doing this because these guys are great bastards. We do it for fun and laugh at their snobby bride, not to mention our hubbies. Besides, Daryl wasn't that bad. The hell with it, Chris intervened. I almost quit the game. He was useless. I don't understand how he and Linda are still married. She must have had someone on her side because Daryl is very bad at bodily matters. Damn. I thought he was pretty good, Kendra said. Cindy laughed. Everyone laughed. But to become serious for a minute, how many more men will we play this game with? As far as I'm concerned, Richard will be my last. Unless he's the best lover in the world, then I might keep him for a while. Of course not. You know the rules. We met with him for one session, but no more after that. I still say this Richard guy might be my last. Am I the only one who feels a little guilty about sleeping with our friends' men? Asked Chris. Hell no, Kendra said. These ladies are not our friends. Linda Bradford was, and probably still is, the biggest snob in town. Every time I see her with Daryl, I laugh to myself that I slept with him. Probably before that bitch did. I agree, said Julia. Jeanette is no exception. She always looks down on her because her father is a state senator. I guess, Chris said. But one day, one of the men will open his mouth and we'll all be in the shit. Okay, ladies, calm down. The wedding is in two months, so we need to work quickly. And now here's what we have for him. Richard Hughes. I am 37 years old, handsome bastard. As far as we know, he really loves Jeanette and wouldn't cheat on her. At least until he meets us. Another hoarse laugh. He loves drag racing and hangs out at the track every Sunday after church. He's also a vegan, so chicken fried steak wouldn't pull his trigger. Oh, and he eats a lot of fruit. Pineapple is his favorite. Chris, what are your plans for him? If we follow our regular schedule, I have a week, right? I have to show up next Wednesday for our card game. And provide video evidence, Cindy said. I always do this, don't I? In any case, my initial plan would be to have it delivered to my house under the pretext of picking out a gift for Jeanette. I still have the video equipment we use, so the recording will be very helpful. When I'm done, I'll give it to Julia so she can use it. Do you still have the videos we made? Certainly, they are locked in a safe that Matt doesn't know about. When we're done with our little game, we'll have a private party, watch them all again, and then destroy them. Since Chris was talking, I assumed that there was a safe in the house that she was talking about. The girls started playing cards again. I removed the disc from the burner and replaced it with a blank one, hoping to gain more information during the card game. I took the new BMW back to the dealer where my car was parked. The original plan was to park the new car in Sammy's garage, and I could just walk next door to my house. Sam would take me to get the car later. I got in the car and called Sammy. Hello, Matt. You did it? No. I took it back to the dealer. Why? Is there something wrong with her? No. The car is fine, but you and I need to talk. Urgently. About what? Not on the phone, Sammy, but it must be before you go home, and under no circumstances should you talk to Julia before you talk to me. Jesus Christ, Matt, what's happening? Just tell me where and when we will meet. Fine. Come to my office and wait. I'll come as soon as I can. It was almost five when his meeting ended. His secretary filled me with coffee and strudel in honor of their German guests. When he entered, he was almost floating in the air, the merger was about to happen, and he was a happy camper. Okay, Matt, what's happening? I thought a lot about how I was going to present what I heard, but I came to the conclusion that the easiest way was to simply play the video. I handed it to him, and he inserted it into his computer. Just as he started playing, his cell phone rang. If it's Julia, don't talk to her, I said. He looked, and it was like that. He turned off the phone and turned on the video, when it was all over, we just looked at each other. Finally, he spoke. What the hell did I just see? And who were these people? Good questions, I said. Now what are we going to do with them? Before we do anything, we need more information. For example, watch the videos they talked about. 
I agree, I said. That's why I left the camera on and running when I left. We will record everything they say while they are saying it in the lair. In the meantime, I'll try to find the safe Chris was talking about and see if their equipment and video footage is there. If Chris has to cheat before their next card game, I'll have to do something soon. I agree, Sammy said. I left a new car at the car dealership. I didn't know what to do with it. Everything is fine. I'll check tomorrow and see if they take it back. If Julia cheats with other men, I'll be damned if she gets a new car from me. We were just leaving his office when Chris called. Where are you? Do you know what time it is? I'm with Sammy and I'm going home. I'll be there soon. Fine. Love you. I love you too. But I'm not sure how much longer I'll love, I thought to myself. Sammy, do you have a private detective that you use? Yes, what should be done? Could he find out who Richard Hughes is and where he works and all that? Of course, Sammy said. Fine. You know this Jeanette the girls were talking about? Not really. Fine. She and Richard will be married in two months. Let's see what a detective can do about it, I said. I think at some point we will have to involve other husbands in this matter. Isn't it? I know. Let's wait and watch the video. I know for a fact that if Chris sleeps with one more guy, our marriage will be over. It's the same with me, and I'm sure other husbands will feel the same. When I returned home, Chris was sitting in our den. She stood up, came up to me and tried to kiss me, but I turned my head and her kiss hit my cheek. She was surprised when I turned my head, but simply asked, did you have a hard day? Yes, everything is fine, you look tired. This is true, I'm going to take a shower and go to bed. Help is needed? She asked with a smirk on her face. Not today, I said. Maybe never again, I thought. The next day was Thursday. I took the day off and she had some things to do. Before she could leave, I started looking for the safe. It took me five hours to find it. I didn't stop during those five hours and completely combed my entire house. I quickly looked through the garage and adjoining workshop because I spent a lot of time there and I didn't think she would put it in such an obvious place. The most logical place, in my opinion, was her closet, because I rarely went there. I finally found it in the living room fireplace. All three of our fireplaces had natural stone inserts. I crawled around the floor looking for anything out of place. A crack in the floor. A small hole in the wall. Something suspicious. I looked at the fireplace several times and saw nothing. And there it was. A tiny scratch on the marble fireplace. This in itself would not have piqued my interest but the scratch was arched, as if there was something on the axle. I took out the screen and pulled the left end of the fake insert. She moved. I pulled it out as far as I could and saw where a square had been cut into the marble fireplace. There were also two holes in the marble floor. At the bottom of the fake log were two long metal skewers. I inserted them into two holes and felt a piece of marble pop out. I removed the heavy piece of marble and set it aside after looking at the spring-loaded locking device. I leaned over, looked down, and saw the safe's dial. I sat down on the floor and stared at the fireplace. My body was shaking. Anything she had that required a password or code was somehow derived from her birth date, so it wasn't too difficult to figure out the combination. The door opened on the third try. The inside of the safe was about a foot square and about a foot deep. Inside was a small video camera with various wires and cables, as well as several videos. I was tempted to take them out, but decided to wait until I knew I had more time. I closed and locked the safe and went to the refrigerator for a beer. I took a long sip and called Sammy. Hey, Matt, he said without enthusiasm. Hello, Sammy. You can speak? Yes. She's actually on deck with your wife. Did you have the opportunity to watch yesterday's video? Hell no. Maybe tomorrow. Fine. I found the safe that Chris installed. It contained several videos and a small camera. Did you watch the videos? He asked. No. I knew she was not at home, but I was afraid that she would catch me. I didn't know she was at your house. They're getting up, so she's probably getting ready to leave. We hung up. Five minutes later, the garage door opened and she pulled inside. Entering the house, 
She put down the bag she was carrying and tried to kiss me. I did the same thing I did before. She wanted to say something, but changed her mind. She started eating dinner. I barely ate anything, but she definitely had an appetite. Later, in bed, she started pestering me, but I thanked her, rolled over, and then fell asleep. The next day was Friday. Chris left home at 9. I follow at her. Sammy called to me as I followed her. His investigator had some news about Richard Hughes. He was a creature of habit. He was a bankruptcy lawyer whose office was right across the street from Sammy's house. Never married. He was a piscopal who always went to church every Sunday, had lunch every day in the same place at the same time. He always came to work at the same time and left at the same time. He was engaged to Jeanette Faraday and the wedding was two months away. The ceremony was to take place at St. Anthony's Episcopal Church, followed by a reception at the Country Club. The reception was a sit-down dinner for 200 people. We talked for a few more minutes, and I continued to follow Chris until she pulled into the public garage. I sat outside and watched her walk out of the garage, walk half a block, and turn into an office building. I knew where she was going, but I had no idea how long she was going to stay. I decided to go home and check the safe. I pulled out the videos. They were all marked, Julia and Daryl, Kendra and David, Cindy and David, etc. All four women had videos of David and Daryl. Either they were just playing their game with these two, or they just started recording their dates with them. Of course, I was more interested in whether my own wife had actually cheated with another man, or two, but there was another side of me that was interested in other wives as well. Kendra had the perfect body. I've been wanting to see it for a long time, and it lived up to my expectations. Cindy always struck me as the quietest one in the group. I had a hard time believing that any of them could cheat, but out of all of them, I thought Cindy would be the least likely. I was very wrong. She was funny to watch. Then it was Chris's turn. I've put this off for too long. I've embedded a video labeled Chris and Daryl. Seeing her with someone else, I became convinced that I would never kiss her again. I stopped the video and called Sammy. Sammy, this was all recorded on video. Chris, Cindy, Kendra, and Julia. Each of them has two videos. Each one shows them cheating with some guys named Daryl and David. I'm going to make copies for each of us and our lawyers. I don't know about you or others, but I won't stay married to Chris after what I saw. Me too, but let's set up a meeting with the other two and see what they say. Fine. I'll arrange everything. Let's do it at my house, Sammy suggested. Julia will be with her parents tomorrow evening. The next day will be Saturday. Chris had until Wednesday afternoon to sleep with Richard Hughes. A week didn't seem like enough time to do this to anyone. But if anyone could do it, it would be Chris. We had a lot of blank discs, so I made copies for all four of us husbands and four more for our lawyers. I put the originals back in the safe. I packed some clothes, called my brother and asked if he wanted to join me for the weekend. He lived on a lake not far from where I lived. It was close enough that I could keep an eye on Chris. I called her. Hello, honey. Where are you? She asked. On the way to Harold's. I'll spend a few days with him. I could almost hear her brain working, thinking this was the perfect time for me to leave. This way it would be easier for her to sleep with Richard. When will you be back? Not until Tuesday afternoon. I felt her sigh with relief. Fine. Have fun. One of two things had to happen. She was going to cheat on Sunday or Monday. My bet was on Monday. She will meet him in a restaurant, make him an offer he can't refuse, and take him to our home. Most likely she made first contact with him when I followed her into the city center. She would have done this when she arrived at his office building. She could have met him on Saturday and, of course, on Sunday at the races, which he always attended. Meeting him on Monday wouldn't be that much of a stretch. I went to my brother's and we drank beer. After the second one, I brought him and his wife up to date. I called the other two husbands and told them we had an appointment at Sammy's the next day. Their names were Jeff and Tommy, and they were married to Kendra and Cindy, respectively. When we got to Sammy's house, he brought each of us a beer. Okay, Matt, this is your show. Fine. First of all, Sammy and I only found out about this on Wednesday. 
we would like to ask all of us to keep what we know a secret until we actually have a plan to deal with it. We could all go off on our own, but I think it will have more of an impact if we do everything we do as a group. You're talking in circles, Matt. Give us a clue, said Kendra's husband, Jeff. Fine. All of our wives have cheated on us at least twice and they have chosen their next target. Bullshit. Cindy would never cheat on me, Tommy said. I remembered the video of Daryl. I picked up the video. All the evidence is here. I passed them around. How do you know? I told them. I ended with the words, Apparently, they pick some bride-to-be that they don't particularly like, and they all sleep with the potential groom, and they do it for the crap and the giggles. Now I know I'm going to divorce Chris, and Sammy is going to divorce Julia, but we don't know anything about you guys. This is still new to you, and you need time to digest it. All we ask is that everything we do, we do together. This means you don't tell wives that we know what they have done or are planning to do. Chris must sleep with Richard Hughes before Wednesday and record it to prove to others that she did it. Then it's Julia's turn, and she has a week. Then Kendra, who also has a week, and finally Cindy, who also has a week. I believe Chris is going to do this at our house on Monday. She will set up her camera, but I will too. I'd like to film them all together in a month, bragging about how they did it, and then we'll arrest them. That would mean we all sit on what we know and let our wives get on with it. That sounds like a plan I could go with, Sammy said. But Tommy, you will have the hardest time waiting all this time. What do you think? Tommy waved the two discs he held in his hand. I'm going to wait a couple of days before I look at it, then I'll decide. Fair enough, I said. But if you decide you can't wait, let us know before you do anything. We'll be done. Since we already have a video of how they cheat, why are we waiting? Why don't we confront them now? Asked Jeff. We could, but I think we would have the biggest impact on videos of them gloating about how they cheated on their stupid husbands for fun. We adjourned the meeting and all went off to deal with the same situation in four different ways. I stayed at my brother's house until Monday morning and went home. Chris wasn't there, so I looked in the safe to find the missing camera. I went into our bedroom and imagined the angle at which she was holding the camera. And so it was. I looked around to decide where to put the camera. I put it there. If I was right, she would have invited him there that same day. I tried not to let Julia see me because she and Sammy live next door. I went out and sat on the road, waiting. At two o'clock in the afternoon, two cars drove down my street. The first car belonged to Chris, and she opened the garage door, then motioned for the second car to come into the garage. He left and she closed the door. Like I told her, I was home on Tuesday. While she was taking a shower, I looked and her camera had disappeared. Mine was still there, so I took it off. In bed, she tried to pester me, but I directly told her that I was not interested. Why isn't it interesting? She asked. Do you get it anywhere else? I looked at her. No. And you? She turned ten shades of red, punched the pillow, and slammed her head against it. I waited about ten seconds before asking. Well? Well? Are you getting it somewhere else? Fuck you, was her answer. Oh, you're allowed to ask, but I'm not. This is all? I said, screw you. I laughed. She jumped out of bed, grabbed the rumpled pillow, and left. Kendra and Jeff were supposed to be playing cards on Wednesday. Jeff had the same monitoring system as Sammy. She filmed in any room where there was movement, except bathrooms. After the game was over, Jeff took the video and we all went to his house to watch it. It all started with Chris bursting into the room, waving the video in the air. She gave the video to Kendra, who inserted it into her car. We couldn't see it, but we certainly heard and saw the girl's reactions when it played. Julia had until next Wednesday to repeat everything, and she had already started working on it. She made an appointment as a client and planned to meet with him again the next day. Damn, I've had the hardest time, Chris said. I only had a week. Julia is already working on it, then Kendra has even more time, and Cindy is the last one. It won't be hard for either of you to force him because, like most men, he's a hound. 
The problem will be that Jeanette will try to hold him back. Which brings us to now, Chris said. This was my last game. It was fun, but I just don't want our luck to run out. Besides, Matt hasn't touched me in a couple of weeks, and I'm worried. Maybe he gets it somewhere else. That's exactly what I asked him last night. What did he say? He said, No. What about you? Oh, shit. What did you say? Nothing. I went to bed in the guest room. This started the conversation about stopping. Chris talking to me made them all scared. Julia and Kendra wanted to stop immediately, but Cindy wanted to continue. Chris agreed with Julia and Kendra that the game should end immediately. Cindy reluctantly agreed. All four husbands decided to contact the same lawyer and not wait any longer. Tommy knew one of them and arranged for us all to meet him together. Chris tried several times to make amends, especially over the weekend, but nothing worked. Finally, on Monday, she asked me why I didn't want to have sex. Because you never answered my question. What question? You asked me if I could get it anywhere else and I said no. I asked you the same thing and you just said fuck you, you never answered. I'll ask you again. Do you get this anywhere else? No, I'm not going to, she said, with a straight face. I think that was an honest answer because she hasn't gotten it anywhere else since she left the game. But I wasn't going to let her off the hook that easily. When did you stop? She just stared at me. Fuck you, asshole. Of course, I won't get anything from you. Maybe I'll go somewhere else for this. I'm sure this won't be the first time. I shouted after her as she ran out of the room. She stopped, turned, looked at me, cried, and left. I watched as she went next door to Sammy and Julia's house. The next week we didn't say a single word to each other. The four of us met with Tommy's lawyer. He sat stunned as we told our story. This is a first for me, he said, and probably a first in the state. We're about to make legal history. To hell with history. We just want a divorce. Okay, he said. Give me a few days to collect all the documents, and we will serve them all at the same time. Everything should be ready for their next card game on Wednesday. This is fine. We all agreed that it was, and we all wanted to be there. At the meeting, I learned that silence was the order of the day in the other three houses. Both Sammy and I caught snippets of conversation between Chris and Julia. They were both bothered by our silence and lack of passion. They admitted that ending their game was probably a good idea. It was the following Wednesday when the shit hit the fan. The girls gathered at Kendra and Jeff's house for their weekly game. They grabbed their drinks and took their places at the card table when four husbands entered, accompanied by a fifth man. What? What? What are you guys doing here? Chris stammered. We all have gifts for our loving wives, Sammy said. Mr. Davis, would you do us the honor, please? With pleasure. Mrs. Kendra Adams? It's me, Kendra said, taking the envelope. Don't open it until everyone has been given away, Mr. Davis said. Mrs. Cindy Lawson. I, Mrs. Christine Womack. It's me. And Mrs. Julia Wright. I, okay, now you can all open them and congratulate each other. You've all been served. Enjoy your card game, ladies. Kendra spoke first. Jeff, what the hell does this all mean? It's about Daryl, he said, tossing her a video that said, Kendra and Daryl, and David. He threw another video. Do I need to say anything else? All four of us were begging, sobbing, moaning, and crying as we walked out. I was sitting in the office watching TV when she came in and sat down in her chair. How long have you known? Long enough. Can we talk about this? No. So, what's going on? You pack your shit and leave. I won't do this until I talk to a lawyer. Fine. Talk to Richard Hughes. He is one of them. I mean, the divorce lawyer. Don't forget to show him your videos and this. I threw her two more videos. What is it? This is where all four of you brag about how much fun it was to play your game and how much fun it was to laugh at your husbands. She sat for a long time with a detached look. How long will you give me to move out? Before dawn. You can't be serious. Everything that remains in this house after dawn, 
will be thrown away. You can pick it up curbside. With these words, I turned back to the TV. An hour later, her father and brother showed up with pickup trucks and trailers. Matt? She asked. Yes? What can I take from the furniture? Anything you want, especially a bed. Her father came up to me. What's happening? Ask your daughter. Yes, but she doesn't want to talk. She cheated on me with at least three men and filmed it. She then showed the video to her friends and bragged about it. Get her things out of here by dawn. I took him out of the office and sat down, listening to the knocking and movement of furniture. The sun was already rising when I heard the trucks driving away, and there was a knock on the door. Enter. I have everything except what I want from this room. It's dawn now. Your time is up. But Matt, it's dawn now. Leave your key and garage door remote on the kitchen island when you leave. But Matt, I closed the door while she stood there. I heard her cry when she left. I waited a few minutes before entering the next room. She did a pretty good job of choosing the furniture she wanted. The upstairs bedroom was empty. My t-shirts, shorts, socks, and other things that I had stored in my dresser were scattered on the floor. I looked, and her closet was empty. Out of curiosity, I checked the secret safe. It was empty. I made myself a cup of coffee and got ready for work. Sammy was leaving at the same time as me, so we stopped and chatted. I saw her leave this morning. Did you kick her out? He asked. That's exactly what I did. I gave her until dawn so her father and brother helped her. What about you? I'm leaving for Germany in a week, and I'll be gone for two months. I gave her time until then. Where is she now? Trying to sleep. We didn't sleep most of the night. Are you still divorcing her? Oh, hell yes. Any news from the other two? Not yet. We both got to work. I was involved in high-end real estate. My parents and I owned several large pieces of real estate that we developed, as well as 15 business rental properties. We were doing well. I spent the entire morning in the office, mostly chatting with my father and updating him on my personal situation. That afternoon, I stopped by one of the properties we were developing and spoke with the site manager and then headed home. The house had not seemed empty before, but when I entered it, there was an eerie, empty, echoing sound that seemed uncomfortable to me. I turned on some music to reduce the echo. This helped a little. The next morning I worked, but after lunch I went to buy furniture. I couldn't leave my underwear in a pile on the floor. I knew I was a little out of touch with the cost of some household items, but the cost of a set of sheets shocked the hell out of me. The furniture I chose wasn't the best quality, but it would do. They delivered my new items the next day. Everything was in place when I decided to check other husbands. Of course, I talked to Sammy, so I called Jeff Adams first. Hello, Matt. How are you? He said, answering. Not so bad. I'm just wondering how you're doing. Not bad. It's pretty quiet here. I chuckled. And here too. Is Kendra still there? No, and I don't know where she is. I haven't seen her since Wednesday. Have you contacted her family? Hell no. Honestly, I don't care where she is. I was going to spend the weekend picking up her shit and throwing it away. What about you? Everything is fine here. I kicked Chris out Wednesday night and didn't see her. Have you heard anything from the others? I talked to Sammy, I said. Julia is still in their house. He's leaving for Germany in a few days and will be gone for a couple of months, so she'll stay in the house until he returns. I haven't heard anything from Tommy. I decided that I would call him sometime today. Fine. Let me know if he or any of you need anything. I will do so. Thank you. When I called Tommy, no one answered. I tried several times throughout the day, but my calls always went to voicemail. The rest of the weekend passed quietly. Monday morning, I saw Sammy and Julia driving away in her old car. She was driving. Took him to the airport, I guessed. It felt normal to see them together and surreal to remember what had happened over the past few weeks. When I returned home, the environment was even more surreal. I took the beer to the back deck and was just starting to sit down when I heard a noise coming from Sammy's house. I looked and all four ladies from the bridge club were sitting on the deck 
talking, and drinking. I took my beer and returned to the house. I dialed Tommy's number again. He replied. She and Cindy tried to work things out, but to no avail. Looks like quiet little Cindy wanted to keep sleeping with other guys. Tommy didn't like the idea, so divorce was on the line for him too. I needed something to do, so I went to my office and started paying bills. I went to the bank's website and discovered that half of our money was gone, as was half of our investment portfolio. Damn this bitch. I forgot about it. I had over a month to protect my finances, but I didn't. It was a costly mistake. I fussed and fussed until I went to bed at midnight. The Bridge Club ladies' cars were still parked in Sammy's driveway. The next morning, there were three husbands in our lawyer's office. Sammy was in Germany. I told the lawyer about the money and he assured me that I would most likely get it all back. How? I asked. In the package that all the wives received, there was a court order stipulating that none of you could spend any money other than normal living expenses without the court's consent. Today she will be served and forced to return everything to its place until the court allows it. I breathed a huge sigh of relief. That evening my phone rang. It was Chris. What do you want, Chris? What should I live on? I don't care. I'm still your wife. Only in name. You stopped being my wife when you started playing your little game. Matt, it was a mistake, and I'm really sorry. You should have thought about it. Oh, I'm so sorry. And none of them were as good as you, honey. Let me go home and talk. No way in hell. You can continue to live with your parents. I won't stay with them. I'm staying with Julia. What are you doing? I'm staying with Julia. Does Sammy know? He's in Germany. Why should he care? I laughed out loud. Give me the money back, Chris, or I'll throw your ass in jail. I ended the conversation. The money was returned the next day. My life went on. Sometimes I would see Chris next door working in the yard, washing his car, or just messing around. She never spoke, and neither did I. It's time for the first meeting. It didn't do her any good. The videos were her downfall, and she knew it. The best she could get was a little alimony and nothing more. Her lawyer fought everything he could, and my lawyer fought back. We won, and everything was settled. The rest were the same. Sammy flew to the first meeting and found out that Chris was living in his house. He let her stay. He's a much nicer guy than me. We all had divorce hearings with the same judge on the same day. The newspapers caught wind of it, as did the television stations. The courtroom was crowded with journalists. It even became national news and was big news for a week. Several reporters dug deeper into the story and learned about the sex games at the Bridge Club. This made the case even more scandalous, especially when three men were exposed. The logical conclusion was three more divorces and new news reports. Before their little sex game was interrupted, none of the four wives needed a job, but divorces changed that. The alimony they received never allowed them to live anywhere near the way they lived before. Sammy returned home and Julia and Chris were not home. The four husbands would get together from time to time to have a few beers and talk about how our lives were going. Our life went on. Sammy and I lived next door, remained friends, and ate and drank together quite often. I even watched his house when he went to Germany for short trips. The other two, Jeff and Tommy, eventually went off into their own little worlds, and we never saw them again. After about six months, I started meeting Julia more and more often at Sammy's. One autumn day, he invited me for a drink. Julia was there and seemed to feel at home. I treated her the way I always did. During one of his short trips to Germany, Julia rang my doorbell. Come in, I said. Could we chat for a few minutes? Certainly. Have a seat. We sat in silence for a while before she began. What we did was pretty stupid. You will receive no objections from me. I don't even know how it started. It was something about women you didn't like. Yes, but not really. This doesn't make any sense, I said. Matt, none of this made sense. We ruined four marriages, mostly on a bet. Argument? And it all ended in the destruction of seven marriages, as far as I remember. You are right. It was seven. God, how stupid. I let her sit and think. Actually, I think it was Ellie's idea originally. Ellie was Eleanor Swenson. 
She was their substitute bridge player. When one of the regular players was not available, she was invited. She sat in Cindy's place and told us about one of the ladies at the country club who was nothing but an obnoxious bitch. We all knew her, but we didn't really think as badly of her as Ellie did. Anyway, Ellie said that this lady, I don't even remember her name, was bragging about her new husband and how short she kept his leash. He couldn't even urinate without her permission. Anyway, Ellie said she thought it would be great to sleep with this new husband on a tight leash, so she did. After she told us that story, I think Chris came up with the idea that we could do this with all the women we didn't like, only we would all have a man, be it a fiancé, a husband, or just a boyfriend. We were all high on booze at the time, and it sounded funny. The following Wednesday, I mentioned it in passing, and Cindy, who had not been there last week, asked what we were talking about. Kendra filled her in, and we all laughed. Then Kendra mentioned Linda Bradford, and it turns out we all disliked her and her big mouth. Cindy looked at Kendra and said, I dare you. She's getting married in three months. I want to do this. I asked if she wanted something to drink. Just water, please. I poured her a glass and she took a sip before continuing. Kendra told Cindy that she would do it if Cindy agreed. Cindy then took a deep breath and said she would do it if we all did it. That's how it all started. Ellie never became part of the group and, in fact, never knew about it until the divorce. We never mentioned it when she played with us. Holy shit, I said. And all this is for a bet. To her. But you all seem to enjoy it? Who doesn't like sex? She asked. Do you still play cards with four players? I asked. Every Wednesday. We were stupid, but we were stupid together. We were friends before we were stupid. We were friends during our stupidity, and we are still friends. Only now we like to think that we are not so stupid, and the conversation goes differently. I laughed. Really laughed for the first time in a long time. Let me ask you a question, I said. Shoot. I'm guessing that since you all regret the day you started your little game, you're unhappy with what you did to your husbands. Are any of you glad you got divorced? Are you glad we got divorced? Maybe Cindy. Are any of you dating anyone? She smiled. I'm trying to negotiate with Sammy, as you know. At the moment, Kendra is not interested in dating. Cindy sleeps with everyone. And Chris. Chris is sitting at home crying and looking at your wedding photos. She wants to talk to you, but she's afraid. Afraid? Why? She thinks that if she doesn't talk to you, things will eventually calm down and you might like her again. Notice I said like. She knows that you will never love her, but she would at least like to be friends. What if she talks to me? And if she talks to you, it will make you remember what she did, and you will hate her again. She knows, like the rest of us, that she screwed up. But the worst thing for her is what you saw. And she, like the rest of us, enjoyed the damn part. Well, you can tell her that I don't hate her. You can also tell her that we will never be friends, so she should move on with her life. We chatted for a few more minutes before she left. Not even a year has passed since my divorce. Sammy and Julia were divorced, but lived together. They tried very hard to make their life together work. It helped that Sammy spent time in Germany and Julia could look after the house. And of course, when he returned home, she always had a warm bed for him. One Saturday afternoon, Sammy, Julia, and I were grilling steaks on the back deck when we heard the front door ring. Julia went into the house and returned with Chris. Hello, she said. I was just passing by and decided to stop and say hello. Sammy and I just looked at each other. He shrugged it as if to say, I don't know anything. Sammy, thanks, but I have to go, I said. Goodbye, Julia. I didn't say anything to Chris. I stepped off the deck and headed home. Matt, I kept walking. Matt, damn it, talk to me. I continued walking until I felt her grab my arm. I stopped and turned to her. There were tears in her eyes. I'm sorry. You're welcome, Matt. I'm sorry. I screwed up and I regret it. Just forgive me and give me a chance to talk to you. 
What can you say that you haven't already said? Should I say that you apologize for the thousandth time? Should I say that you were wrong for the thousandth time? Or that you regret it just as many times? The fact remains a fact. You thought so little about our marriage and about me that you thought it was normal. How can I forgive you for this? You forgave Julia. I had nothing to forgive her for. What she did or does remains between her and Sammy. She was his wife, not mine. I didn't care what she did then or what she does now. Her behavior is none of my business, but you were my wife, my soulmate, my meaning in life, and you gave three other assholes the most precious thing that one person can give to another. What you promised was only mine. I can't forgive you for this. You'll never forgive me, will you? She asked sadly. No, and not gonna. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. She turned and walked, sobbing, across the yard to her car. I'm going home. Sammy called me a few minutes later and told me my steak was ready. I returned, and the three of us enjoyed our meal. I saw Chris at Sammy's house almost every day when Sammy was gone. She never came, but sat and watched. Sometimes it seemed to me that she wanted me to see her, and sometimes she didn't. One Sunday afternoon, when Sammy was at home, I called him and asked him to come over. Julia was at home, otherwise I would have gone there. I got two beers out of the refrigerator for us. Tell me how you did it. What did you do? Forgave Julia. He took a long sip of beer and swallowed it. I was in Germany, was there for a week or so, had dinner with one of the board members, and we started talking about sex. He and all of Europe look at sex differently than we do. It's more casual. Married people having sex outside of marriage rarely causes divorce. A carelessness here or there doesn't seem to matter much. Essentially, he said that married couples should think before they divorce and decide whether they are happy with or without their spouse and go from there. I love Julia. Still. When I returned from my two-month trip, I had almost forgotten what she had done and was glad to see her. It didn't last long because I remembered how much she liked being cheated on me. I asked her to leave. Chris left too. When I had more trips and came home to an empty house, I began to think about what my German friend told me. On my next trip, I met a lady at a bar and we had sex. When I got home that time, I called Julia and we had dinner. A week later, we were already having sex. There was still something better about the British girl and I can't say exactly what it was, but Julia was good. It dawned on me that, besides sex, I missed her. Her smile, her sense of humor, her very presence next to me made my life better. Three weeks later, she returned. It's similar to how it was when we were married, and I found that I rarely thought about her with other men. What if she does it again? I asked. Yes, that's the rub, he said. I couldn't bear to have my heart broken again. I will probably then move to Germany and run my company from there. Maybe I'll get used to the European way of life. He simply said that Julia was good in bed, but I remember him telling the husbands that she was probably the worst of the four wives. Maybe his renewed love for her, and that's what she seemed to be, was compensating for something like a grade on the curve. Over the next two months, I thought long and hard about what Sammy said and even started calling Chris three times, but I just couldn't pull the trigger. One evening, Sammy, Julia, and I went out to dinner. I wanted to talk to both of them about this forgiveness they had. We were halfway through dinner and Sammy was telling me how he struggled with forgiving Julia. It wasn't easy, but I think I finally did it, he said. Julia leaned over and covered his hand with hers. And don't think that it was easy for me to forgive myself, she said. I'm still struggling with it. It was, without a doubt, the stupidest thing I've ever done. Both Sammy and I agreed with her. I excused myself and went to the toilet. When I returned, a man and woman were approaching our table. They held hands. I reached the table just in time to hear Chris's voice. Hello, Sammy. Julia, it was nice to meet you here. Hello, Chris. We're here with Matt. She let go of her boyfriend's hand. Matt, where is he? Right here, Chris. I said. She turned to face me. Who is your friend? I pointed her out to her date. Uh, this is Jim. He is my friend. It's good to have friends, I said, sitting down, putting a napkin on my lap and starting to eat the food that was brought while I was in the toilet. 
Well, maybe we should go, Chris said, looking straight at me. Sammy and Julia said goodnight to them. I took a sip of wine. Her being on a date pretty much answered my question about forgiveness. I nodded. We ended dinner without mentioning Chris or her beau. I don't know what I expected, but Chris took every opportunity to beg me to forgive her and bring her back to try again. While dating, she apparently refused any reconciliation with me. I hadn't dated anyone since my divorce, but after that dinner, I decided it was time to do so. Dating might not be the right word. I didn't want a date. I wanted sex. And the first thing that came to my mind was Julia's comment about Cindy. I remembered how wild she was in the video and was tempted, but decided not to. I didn't need a social illness. I also ruled out Kendra as a possible sexual partner. I even briefly thought about asking Chris, but I was afraid that she would take it as me wanting her back, as opposed to me just wanting her body. The Tall Stacks Convention and Race was held in Cincinnati. For a whole week, steamboats from all over the United States converged on Cincinnati for racing, exhibitions, demonstrations, and general frivolity. It was a week-long throwback to the glory days of steamboats. People wore period costumes and behaved accordingly. Cincinnati also had an actual showboat that hosted live productions. They called her Majestic, and she was beautiful. Sammy, Julia, Chris, and I often watched her show. I haven't been to her show since I got divorced, but I was downtown one Friday night and thought of her. I took a chance, and of course there was a show. I parked, got my ticket, and walked across her deck until they opened the doors for us. The show was crazy, and I laughed a lot during the first act. At intermission, I was enjoying a glass of wine while walking on her deck again and looking out over the water of the Ohio River when I heard her. Hello, Matt. Do you like the show? Without looking at her, I said, Yes, Chris. And you? Yes. It's not as fun as it used to be, but it's still fun, she said. I looked at her. Where is your date? I don't have one. Where is yours? I don't have one either. Why not? I looked at her. Why do you care? Besides, I could ask you the same thing. Just curious. At that moment, a man approached with two glasses. There you are, Chris. Thank you, Jonathan. No date, huh? I asked her. At the restaurant, his name was Jim. Unless he's the other guy. I looked at Jonathan and he was definitely different. This guy was old enough to be her father. Jonathan... This is my ex-husband, Matthew Womack. Matt, Jonathan Precip. We shook hands, Jonathan spoke. Good evening, Matthew. I've heard a lot about you. I'm Matt, please. Fine. Matt, I'm Jonathan. I understand that you like Majestic. That's right, I said, and looked at Chris. The rim of her wine glass was at her lips, and she looked at me over the glass. Who told you that I like Majestic? Chris, of course, he replied. Of course, I repeated. She said you had ideas on how to help save her. I looked at Chris and she looked away. Can I ask what this has to do with you? Oh, sorry. I belong to a group interested in preserving things like our zoo, the Fountain Square Fountain, the Taft Museum, and other sites worthy of preservation. And how exactly does Chris fit into this? I looked at her just as the bell rang calling us back to our seats for the second act of the play. Can we talk after the show? He asked. We'll see, I dodged. After the show, I went straight to my car and drove away. I hadn't gone far when my phone rang. Working in real estate, I almost always answered it. Hello, I replied. Where have you gone? Jonathan was looking for you. I didn't know she still had my number. I definitely didn't have one. How did you know that I would be there tonight? And why did you introduce us? You know I hate being ambushed like this. I had no idea you'd be here. We were here, and just happened to see you. He's quite old for you to date, isn't he? It wasn't a date. Several committee members were there to review it. They are trying to decide if they want to invest in saving the Majestic. And how exactly do you fit into this? No, wait, I don't want to know because I don't want to talk to you. Goodbye. Wait, Matt. You don't have to talk to me. Is it okay if I give him your number? You can talk to him and I won't interfere. I thought about it, 
I talked about trying to do something, but never did it. Perhaps this is my chance. Fine. Tell him to call me tomorrow. He did it. We talked about the goals of his organization, but after seeing Majestic, he and the members of his organization were not sure that this was their project. Our other interests attract the masses. Majestic has limited appeal, and we don't think we want to mess with it. Why were you on the show last night? I asked. Your ex-wife pushed us. She told us how much you two and apparently some friends enjoyed being there. She then went on and on about how you and your friend were always talking about getting some money together to repair the boat and upgrade it. She is very convincing when she wants to be. I remembered that she only had a week to sleep with Richard, and how convincingly she must have said, I agree with you. How did you meet her? She's engaged to my son, Jim. Ah, now it's clear. Well, congratulations. There was a long pause and I thought he had left, but no. Matt, can I be frank? Certainly. I don't know if it's suitable for my son. There is something about her that makes me feel uneasy. You are her ex-husband. You know her better than anyone, I'm sure. Could you tell me why you divorced her? Now I was between a rock and a hard place. Should I tell him the truth? Lie or not answer? What? If she changed and tried to live differently, then my answer could ruin everything for her, and did I want that? Jonathan, the way she acted as my wife may have had something to do with what I did or didn't do in our relationship, and I hesitate to throw words around. I'm very sorry, but it would be dishonest of me to respond to you and possibly forestall your feelings for her. You speak like a true gentleman, and I respect that. Let me ask you one more question. In my business, which is trucking, I work with the conservation committee only as a hobby. When my company wants to hire a new driver, we are allowed to call their previous employer. We're limited in what we can ask and how, but the final question we usually ask is, would you hire this person again? I'll ask you the same question. If you had it to do over again and knew what your marriage was like, would you marry her? It's simple. Hell no, was my immediate answer. I suspected not, he said. Jonathan, our divorce is a public matter. Why don't you or your son take a look at it and then call me and we can chat? The next morning he called me and asked if I could have lunch with him. I was there and we met at a very nice steakhouse on Walnut Street and his son Jim was with him. Jonathan waited while we ordered lunch. Well, we're certainly glad we checked the records. How much of what we read is actually true? He asked. I'm not sure what exactly was included in the records other than the documents and videos that I presented. Jim spoke. Were there actually videos of her with other men? Yes, there are three of them, I answered. And all the other wives were involved in this? They only had two people each. Chris was the only one who had three. Jesus Christ, he said. Do you still have the video? No, was my short answer. We spent the rest of lunch discussing my marriage, it ended up leaving me feeling like they may have sent out the wedding invitations too early. Two days later, Chris called in tears. Why? Why did you do that? What did you do? Told Jim and his father about me. Okay, wait. First, you gave him my phone number. Second, Jonathan asked me why we got divorced, and I didn't tell him. Except for my recommendation that he check the public records. Then I added... I assumed he had contacted the court and read the documents. Jonathan invited me to lunch and asked me questions. He had read the files so he knew what happened, and all I did was answer his questions honestly. This will haunt me for the rest of my life, she said. I really hope so, I told her. Jonathan called me a couple of weeks after we had lunch and invited me to visit his moving company. It was a fairly large room, but I thought it was a little cramped with all his equipment. We shook hands, and he invited me into his office. Chris wasn't a happy camper when Jim broke off their engagement, he said. I had this feeling when she called me and accused me of telling about her, I told him. You didn't tell. We read about it. Anyway, that's not why I invited you here. She, Chris, told me that you are in real estate. Is that true? This is true. Good, because I need to expand. This place is too small. He called the secretary. Joni, ask Trish to come here, please. Then he turned to me. 
Trish is our money lady. You will have to deal with her. Trish turned out to be Jim's sister and, of course, Jonathan's daughter. I stood up when she came in and we shook hands. So you're Chris's ex? She asked. She didn't smile. I chuckled, trying to defuse the situation. Guilty on all counts, and I certainly hope I get a higher score than that. Maybe, she said. We just hope your real estate skills are better than your skills as a husband. I have pretty thick skin, but this was more than I felt I should have taken. I didn't know this woman, but her first comment to me was a serious insult. I was still standing and looking at Jonathan. I think I'm not the person you need. I would be happy to recommend someone who is fully qualified to find you some property. Then I looked at Trish. You obviously know about my marriage because your father and brother discussed it. But if you had been paying attention while they were talking, you would have known that I did nothing wrong before, during, or after the marriage, so that there was nothing wrong with my man skills. I walked to the door, turned, and said, Goodbye, Jonathan. Ma'am, I left, and Jonathan's curses at his daughter echoed throughout the building. My phone rang before I even left their property. It was Jonathan. Matt, come back. She's just in a bad mood. Everything will be okay. No thanks. I don't see where we should go except down. I don't think we would be comfortable working with each other. However, I have given serious thought to finding someone to help you, and I know of at least three properties that would fit your needs. His name is Justin Collier, and I can have him call you today or tomorrow. You are sure? Definitely. Okay, let him call me. Justin called him an hour later and went straight to Jonathan's office. Justin sold him the second building they looked at. Justin offered me half the commission, but I refused. Justin told me that when he met Trish, she was very remorseful and asked him to apologize to me for his behavior. A week after they closed, I was sitting at my desk. I looked up. Trish, or whatever her real name was, stood there. She had a flower in her hand. Can I come in? She asked. I nodded. This is for you, she said, handing me the flower and sitting down. I smiled. Thank you, Miss Prisip, or Mrs. Trish is fine. This is short for Patricia. I nodded again and noted that she didn't give her last name. I behaved badly that day when you came to us. I had no right to imply that you were a bad husband. I thought about this while listening to my father and brother discuss it. The only excuse I can offer is that I had just had a fight with my boyfriend and all men were assholes at that point in my life. I still held the flower in my hand, so I brought it to my nose and inhaled. Very nice, I said. My apologies? She asked. No, flower. Your apology sucks. She almost smiled. If I treated you to dinner, I would have more time, she said. Are you sure? I'm ready to try if that's the case. Fine. When and where? I asked. Give me your address. You deserve the complete package. I'll pick you up. How about Friday at 6.30? I smiled as I wrote my address and phone number on the back of one of my business cards. I was ready for the doorbell when it rang. I opened the door and there she stood with an armful of flowers. It seems like you liked smelling the first flower. This should make you happy for a while. She smiled. And me too. I put them in my kitchen, took one out, and cut the stem short. She just looked at me. I inserted it into the breast pocket of my jacket. We went outside and a limousine was waiting for us. I started laughing when I saw him and almost didn't stop all evening. The evening was one of the best of my life, and I had a feeling it was the same for her. Neither of us had any desire to eat our fill, but we enjoyed the wine and each other's company. When the evening ended, we sat next to each other in the limousine on the way to my home. She even walked me to the door. Thank you, Matt. It was fun. Then she kissed me. I took the flower out of my breast pocket and placed it in the neckline of her dress, leaned over and smelled it. Then I kissed her. She started to leave, but I stopped her. It was one of the best evenings of my life, but I have to ask. Do you still have a boyfriend? I'm not sure. We haven't spoken in a couple of weeks. I took both her hands in mine. If you don't leave him, this will be goodbye. If you do, I'd like to meet again. She kissed me lightly. I would also. I've never had so many kisses on a first and possibly last date. 
It was two days later on Sunday evening. My phone rang. Hello. Hello. This is Trish. I don't have a boyfriend anymore. What's happened? I told him about you, and he told me about his new girlfriend. We parted as friends. In that case, would you like to have dinner on, say, Wednesday night? I asked. She laughed. What if I get hungry before Wednesday? day? It was my turn to laugh. What's the earliest time you'll be hungry? I'm already hungry. When she told me this, I actually laughed. Are you sure? I asked. Absolutely, came her answer. Okay, but you won't have a limousine. Just bring me a flower, she said. I was on my way less than an hour after she gave me her address. I needed to shower and shave before leaving, so I went into the kitchen and picked up one of the flowers she brought me two days ago. The first thing she asked for when I arrived was her flower. I handed it to her and she immediately hid it in her blouse where the top button was fastened. I noticed that the button was at the peak of the bulge of her breasts. I decided that I would smell him before the night was over. It didn't take us long to eat, and she invited me for a drink. There's a little place not far from here that serves great booksy. Would you like to go there? What is this place called? Chess Trish, she said. Not bad, I said. We laughed, drank and even danced until one in the morning, and I decided that it was time for me to go home. I had no intention of doing anything that would embarrass her at this early stage of our relationship. I walked her to the door and we kissed. Then we kissed again. Then I leaned towards the flower and took a deep breath. I reached out and took the flower, being careful not to touch anything other than the flower. I took it in my hand, looked into her eyes and kissed her again. I felt her shudder. I smiled, wished her good night and went home. We had just started our second month of dating and were having dinner at a restaurant. Cincinnati, like every other city in the world, has some great restaurants. We went out at least three nights a week and every weekend except the previous one. Our dining experiences have gone from Chili's in Cincinnati to Michelin-rated restaurants and everything in between. We were looking at each other more than we were eating when I heard a voice that sent shivers down my spine. You're an even bigger asshole than I thought said the voice. You made them get rid of me to get her. It's very sad, Matt. Oh, by the way, hi, Trish. Go to hell, Chris, I said without turning around. Fuck you, Matt, she said in a broken voice and left. Soon after that, we went to my house. It was a Friday night and still early, so I called Sammy and Julia to see if they wanted to join us for drinks. They weren't dating Trish and I decided it was time. After everyone got acquainted, Julia started laughing. I didn't tell Trish that Julia was one of the four ladies of the bridge club. So it's you, said Julia. Who? Trish asked. I just talked on the phone with Chris. I assume you know her? Indeed, I know. She was engaged to my brother. She told me that she saw you together. Yes, indeed, Trish said. I would guess that she was not very kind. You're right. I made everyone drinks and we chatted for a few hours before Sammy told us he needed to get some sleep because he was leaving for Germany the next day. So he and Julia left. Good couple, Trish said as they left. Yes, it is. They act like they really love each other. It's nice to see couples like this still exist. How long have they been married? They got married about six years before the divorce. Divorce? It is even better. How long were they divorced before they got married again? They are not married, but they are working on it. Why did they get divorced? Do not tell me. Sammy cheated. I laughed. Sammy? No. You mean she did it? I wouldn't have believed it in a million years. I brought her up to date. Oh my God. I still don't believe it. Why did he take her back? You said it yourself. They act like they're in love. And they are. They are working very hard to overcome what she did, and it seems to be working. Wow. Have you ever thought about discussing this with Chris? Yes, for a very short time. But then I saw her on a date. In fact, she was with your brother, and I decided that she left and I should do it too. I also thought a lot about cheating and decided that once a cheater, always a cheater. I like both Sammy and Julia. But I think one day when he's on one of his trips to Germany or something, she'll cheat again. Are you serious? Yes, it is. 
You wouldn't even try to figure it out if your significant other cheated. Regardless of the circumstances, people in committed relationships do not date, kiss, or cheat with other people. Once a cheater, always a cheater. She interrupted me. Take me home, please. But, take me home, I said. The atmosphere went from, I think I'm going to get laid tonight, to take me home, please, in very short order. The drive to her house was smooth. When we got there, before we even stopped, she had already opened the door and was ready to go out. I hadn't stopped the car completely when she jumped out and, without looking back at me, said, Goodbye, Matt. Wait, I shouted after her, but she was already running, and if she heard, she didn't pay attention to me. I tried to call her the next day, but my calls went straight to voicemail. This went on for a whole week until I walked into her office. I parked and walked to the door when her father stopped me. She doesn't want to see you, Matt. Please don't call her or try to see her. What the hell happened, Jonathan? What have I done? You didn't do anything. It was her. What did she do? Just stay away from her, please. I looked at him and left. She and I haven't seen or spoken to each other for over three months. I dated a couple of women along the way and hooked up for the first time since I got divorced. I began to return to my usual routine. Plus, I grew a beard. I never had one, so I grew it just like that. There was a woman to whom I showed a very nice luxury house. It turns out she likes beards. She was recently divorced and was looking for a new home to live in. She also wanted sex. I've adapted it for both of these things. I had never slept with a potential buyer before. She looked at the house three times, and I was starting to think she wasn't going to buy it. This was our fourth trip to see the house. She was sitting in my car, and we were almost to the house when she spoke. Matt, I don't need to see this house anymore. I'm going to buy it. She was about 10 years older than me, but I didn't care. When we got there, I opened the lock on the door, took out the key to the front door, and put it in my pocket. This will tell someone else that the house has been shown or used. We headed straight to the bedroom. Her name was Ruth, and she loved sex. We had no love, no emotions, no affection, only sex. I fucking loved it. Shortly after, I was looking at properties and decided I wanted some Cincinnati chili. I pulled into the parking lot and realized that this was the first stop Trish and I had stopped at together. I decided to stay anyway. I walked up to the counter, placed my order, and sat in a booth. Before I could do that, my order arrived and I started eating. I was eating, trying not to get the chili in my beard, when two women came in and, like me, had placed their orders and found an empty seat. One of them was Trish. She looked straight at me and I started to say hello, but apparently the beard confused her and she didn't recognize me. They were sitting three booths away from me. I stood up and went to the soda machine to get a Coke. I then grabbed my chili and headed to the booth right behind them. They were talking and did not pay any attention to me. The woman who was with Trish spoke very excitedly. It was the most romantic thing. He got down on one knee with passion and proposed, holding the ring out for me to see. Look, at this point, I assumed she had shown Trish her ring. Trish has had enough respect and said all the right things about how beautiful it was and how lucky she was and other girly things. The food was brought to them and they were already eating when another voice spoke again. When is Howard going to ask you this question? Trish was silent for a few seconds before answering. I... I don't know. You're going to say yes, aren't you? I think so. God, girl. I was head over heels in love when Jamie asked me. After that, I blew his brains out. They laughed. The problem is that Howard's brains are not the ones I want to take out. Come on, Trish. That other guy is history. You killed him when you slept with Howard. Yes, I know. Let's talk about stupid things. I was dating Matt, and Howard was dating someone, so we broke up. Matt and I had only been on a few dates when Howard called. He wanted to talk, so I met with him. His girlfriend left him, and he was feeling depressed, so I'm with him. It certainly wasn't the first time, but I knew it was a mistake when I did it. All this time I was thinking about Matt and pretending that I liked making love to him. 
The entire time Howard was with me, I felt like I was cheating on Matt. When I returned home, I vomited. Damn it, Francie. He was the only one, and I cheated on him. We dated for a few more weeks and I almost forgot about sleeping with Howard because I was really falling in love with Matt and I felt like he was falling in love with me. Then I met his neighbors and heard their story. But what's worse is that I heard Matt's attitude towards scammers. He made it abundantly clear that he hated them and would not stand for it. That's when I remembered Howard and I felt nauseous again. I knew Matt would leave me if he found out, so I didn't give him the chance to leave me because I was out of his life. Come on, Trish. You weren't in a serious relationship. You didn't belong to him, so he can't blame you for that. There was a pause in their conversation. Have you talked to him at all? No. He came over a few months ago, and my father told him to stay away. And then, two months ago, Howard showed up again. At least you're having sex. Trish chuckled. If. My last time was Howard when I screwed up. Jesus, girl, you haven't had a physical relationship in months. Do you know you can go blind? They both laughed. The only one I want is Matt, but he was so adamant about cheaters that maybe I should give in to Howard. I'm really starting to need this. They talked for a few more minutes and left. I followed them. They walked over to Trisha's car and she got in. Francie leaned toward Trisha's window. Why don't you call him? What would I say? The truth. You can't be any worse than you are now. I will think about it. Well, that was an interesting few minutes, I thought. I drove home and immediately went to the next house to talk to Sammy and Julia. Sammy wasn't home, so I lashed out at Julia. You really like this girl, don't you? She asked. I think yes. Things were going pretty well for us until she left. I haven't seen her until today. You never found out why she left until today? Absolutely right. But you are thinking about forgiving her. Yes, but you haven't forgiven Chris. Chris was my wife when she cheated. There's a difference between getting married, cheating, and having sex with an old guy when you're dating a near stranger. Trish and I weren't in a serious relationship. Until today, I had no idea how deep her feelings for me were. I hesitated before speaking again. How are you and Sammy doing? She didn't hesitate. We have our difficulties, but I think we can handle it. We both know the saying, once a cheater, and so on. Especially me, but we never mention it. I love Sammy and would be completely lost without him. Every day I see in his eyes the pain I caused him, and my heart hurts, my soul cries, and I redouble my efforts to show him that he was right, forgave me. If you gave Chris a chance, she'd be the same. But now she has a new boyfriend, so she's moving on. Good for her. We were sitting, so I stood up and walked over to her. I took her by both hands and lifted her up. I'm glad it's working for you and Sammy, and I know you regret what you did. I see it every time I see you look at him. Either I'm not as strong as him, or I wasn't as in love with Chris as I thought. In any case, we will never know. I hugged her. Now I understand why he loves you so much. It's easy to forgive you. She hugged me, then kissed me on both cheeks and I saw tears in her eyes. You cry a lot, don't you? I asked. She nodded. I'm crying because I was stupid. I'm crying because I hurt Sammy. I'm crying because I'm so lucky that he loves me. And I'm crying because I want you to be happy, whether it's with Trish or with someone else. I got out and headed to the next house. I knew what I wanted to do and started doing it. I took out my phone but didn't have time to call because it rang. I looked and it was Trish. I took a deep breath and replied, Hello. Hello, Matt. This is Trish. Can we talk? About what? How did you just walk away and leave me without telling me what I did wrong? Oh my God. You didn't do anything wrong. It was me. I did it. What did you do? Just not on the phone, please. I can come to your house or you can come to mine. When? Now. I can do it in two hours at my house. Fine. In two hours. See you then. Thank you. I ran out and bought her flowers, then took a shower and shaved my beard. She knocked on my door exactly two hours after she called. I opened the door and my heart started beating faster. Hello, Matt. Trish, come in. Can I get you something to drink? 
a strong drink of any kind of alcohol, she said. I poured a generous amount of bourbon into the glass and handed it to her. I enjoyed it. I knew why she was there and I knew what I was going to do, but she seemed scared. I remained very tense, which did not make things easier for her. Please sit down. I pointed to the sofa. She sat down, took a long sip of bourbon and made a face. Then she did it again. I did something really stupid, she began. What have you done? When? Months ago. Oh, that's around the same time you left me. This time she took a small sip and shook her head. It was a couple of months ago. We just started dating. What did you do there? I... Uh, uh. Oh my gosh, this is harder than I thought. She stood up. You and I have only met a few times. She stopped and took another sip. My ex-boyfriend wanted to see me. She stopped, put down the glass and headed towards the door. Maybe I should do this another time. No, I said, grabbing her hand. You started it now and finished it off with this. You'll hate me. No, she took a deep breath. I slept with my ex-boyfriend, so I said it. And now I'll leave. I know about this and you won't go anywhere. At least for now. Her eyes became huge. What you said? I said you weren't going anywhere. She interrupted me. Not this. Now I was playing with her. Oh, this. Yes, I knew about it. You knew? Why did you sleep with Howard? Yes, I knew. The fact that I knew she slept with him was a surprise, but the fact that I knew his name was a big shock. Her face turned pale and her eyes became huge. How do you know? It does not matter. What matters is, are you ever going to do this again? No. God, no. When he asks you to marry him, what will you tell him? She just looked at me, knowing that she slept with him and knowing his name was huge, but knowing that he might propose to her was more than she could bear. She stood shaking her head in complete disbelief. I laughed internally and repeated my question. Well, what are you going to tell him? Um, I'm, uh, going to tell him. Uh, he's not going to ask. How did you know about this? I told you it doesn't matter. Fine. Now you can leave. I walked her to the door, opened it, and pushed her out. I just stood there and waited. It took a little longer than I thought, but there was another knock on the door. I waited and let her knock a few more times. I opened the door. Oh, I thought you wanted to leave. No, I don't want to leave. I want to know how and when you found out about Howard. I took her hand and led her to the kitchen. Oh no, I said. You made me wait several months before you confessed. I'm going to wait that long before I tell you. Does this mean that in a few months you will want me around? She looked into my eyes. There were tears in her eyes. I took the flower and handed it to her. The stem was wet, but she didn't pay attention to it. I raised my head and kissed her. Would you like to be here in a few months? I asked. Months, years, a lifetime. Wherever you are, there I will be, if you let me. We kissed. I took her hand and led her to my bedroom. Do it as if you love it. I had never heard that expression, but it seemed appropriate, and I did it because I loved it. We spent the rest of that evening and all night as if we were in love with each other. The next morning we got up early and showered together. She didn't have a toothbrush, so she used mine. I have never allowed anyone to use my toothbrush. My master bathroom had two sinks. I was with one, and she was with the other. I smiled. When she started brushing her teeth, I just watched. When she was combing her hair, it was interesting to watch. We both had to work that day and she had to go home to change and do her makeup. Are you free at lunchtime? I asked, opening the car door for her. She took the flowers I gave her the day before. She brought them to her nose and inhaled before looking at me with a wide smile. Absolutely right. At what time? 11.30? I'll pick you up. She nodded and kissed me. I watched her drive away and didn't notice that Julia was standing next to me. So, everything seems to be all right between you two, she laughed. I hugged her. If your husband weren't looking, I would kiss you.
I told her. Fuck him. She laughed again. Kiss me anyway. I did it. On both cheeks. This was five years ago. Trish and I have been married for four of those years, and I have never been happier. And neither has Trish. Sammy and Julia got married four months after us. They are our best friends. No one seems to know or care where Chris is. I give Trish flowers at least once a week, and neither of us gets tired of smelling them, no matter where they are on her or my body. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.